Welcome to the Tourism Hub podcast, a podcast devoted to you and your excellence, providing inspiration and education for the entrepreneurs, experience makers and excellent seekers of our industry to take your tourism business and career to a whole new level. And I am your host, Despina Karatias. Hello, hello, good evening and welcome to another exciting episode of the Tourism Hub podcast. I'm thrilled that you're joining us this evening or morning or afternoon, whatever time you've tuned in in from in the day. Thank you to everyone that's joining us live and joining the recording. Now, Tourism Hub, it started as an opportunity to really inspire excellence from leaders in our industry. And my guest this evening is exactly that, a real leading light from a national level with a wealth of experience under his hat. So I'll get straight into it to introduce our guest with you tonight. We have the Executive Director from Australian Tourism Industry Council. He's also the Strategy Director at Royce Com. His name is Simon Westaway and as the Executive Director of ATIC, he's held this position for over a year now. Now, with Simon, he certainly brings over 25 years of senior executive experience inside some of Australia's most prominent companies, including Qantas, Tourism Australia, and even BHP. Made a major impact in roles around Australia's visitor economy and also a senior manager at Regional Airline where he was the executive head of corporate relations and the member of the startup executive for Jetstar Airways for seven and a half years during its formative development from early 2004. So I've been really excited for everyone that joined us. This is, uh, it, it was it was really worth bringing him back and uh, welcome to the Tourism Hub podcast, Simon Westaway. Yay. Hello, nice. Simon. G'day. Hi. Lovely to chat on a decent uh, end to end. So I'm a big fan of yeah. the <laughs> yes, thank you so much. I mean, thank you for coming back. It was it, it is delightful to have you, and I know you're a very busy man. So I appreciate it, and it's lovely that we've got the NBN connection uh, this evening. Now you have a strong. Looking at your background, you have you started in the beginning with a strong academic background in Asian studies and communications. I just wanted to go through again with you. What was it from calling you to study Asian studies and communications that really carved out your career in tourism and the visitor economy? Well, thanks for the opportunity. G'day, listeners. Look, yeah, well, it's it's interesting. Um, I mean, we all. We all travel through our life, don't we? And we all have different experiences. I think for me, where I felt like there was a connection um, and was really post my studies, to be honest, um, I was a, uh, you didn't talk about my CV, I was a political advisor, and a political strategist for many years as a very young young man. And uh, you went through my some of my previous roles and oh my gosh, I've got a few years under my belt now. But, uh, <laughs> but um, yeah, look, I, I, what I found is particularly working in regional air setting so I worked um, for a great regional airline called Impulse Airlines and some of you may have heard of them some of you may not have but um, and the shell of Impulse became Jetstar which is why I got involved in the Jetstar project but Impulse was a quite a sizable regional airline it was connected to ANSET uh, so I bring back some old some old names there and uh, we had a commercial alliance with uh, ANSET and that was slowly pulling apart at the seams and the owners of Impulse, it was a privately owned company and uh, family owned and uh, they'd have been thinking for a long time now about how they could sort of ape and mirror what was going on in Europe with Ryanair and um, quite obsessed with the way Southwest Airlines was developing. And I think at the time in the late 1990s leading into the 2000 Olympics um, and that period, I think there was a view that uh, the aviation industry did really need a bit of a change and a shake-up. Governments have been trying over the years to stimulate um, the industry um, by changing the way slots were done at Sydney Airport without getting too boring, 
um, providing incentives for foreign for foreign ownership in airlines. Um, and ultimately, what came out of it was that the regional players, uh, Impulse, uh, created a domestic startup airline. So they did, did a, an organisation called Virgin, and uh, so we went from having two airlines to four. Uh, in uh, the year 2000, it was around the time of the Olympics. It was all a very heady period, and uh, we got off to a pretty good start. But uh, airlines are very cash hungry, capital hungry. Um, during 2001, the business started to struggle. There was a bit of a dip in the, the economy after the Olympic uh, hubris sort of faded away, and uh, and uh, Impulse folded and went into um, ultimately became Jetstar in later years. But to your question, I think why. The connection as i did a lot of work in impulse we were flying to a lot of very small communities and i just saw the critical importance of a regional air service going into a, a township of eight ten thousand people we used to fly to places like gleniness uh, kempsey um kuma now then in kuma we used we call kuma the snowy mountains airport you know it was a fair way away from uh, threadbow and perisher um, for us we created it as a um as a destination if you like or an access point to a destination so I started to really get to understand how the tourism, um, the tourism piece, as I used to call it, used to connect in with the um, with the, the transport piece. And I guess that's where my interest in in the I guess the regional engagement, regional development, and how air transport supports tourism and vice versa. And having grown up in a in a regional setting, I guess I've I've, I've sort of always had that affinity around around it. So that's really how that journey started. And um, but to be honest with you, I mean, airlines are fantastic. Everyone loves loves airlines. Uh, maybe not so much at the moment because it's pretty hard place to be if you've got a job. But um, I actually, over the years, actually got more enjoyment out of the tourism aspect sometimes than I did the av aviation access um, aspect, if I could be brutally honest with you. So, yeah, look, I think it was just a, an opportunity. I'd be a fantastic opportunity to go work at Tourism Australia. It's a amazing organisation which has done fantastic things for our country. And, um, yeah, look, it's just really, really fantastic time in my life to be able to do that and I've now been fortunate enough to be able to come back in and advocate for their industry um, um, as part of a consulting practice. Incredible and we're very fortunate for that. Seeing now just with your aviation hat on, seeing what the effects of COVID already, I mean early on Virgin was impacted from COVID, do you have a level of concern over our own big airline brands like Qantas? That that like, where do you see that headed? Is there mm. a deep concern there for aviation in Australia coming out yeah. of this? No, it's a great question. Look, aviation's been devastated, um, and yeah, look, I do have a concern about where it's going at the moment. I, I I'm a much more upbeat this afternoon to be <laughs> honest, because South Australia have confirmed that they're going to open up to New South yes. Wales, and that's, to be honest, that's a pretty strategic decision. Um, the day that New South Wales had um, no community transmission for COVID within the state, according to their to their uh, chief medical officer, South Australia came out and said, we're opening, we're opening up. And I think we're going to see a bit of a domino effect start to occur now. It's very strategic by SA. I'm really pleased and proud of the people inside the state that have worked really hard to push this from an industry perspective, but also the SATC. The Tourism Commission and, you know, quite frankly, the Premier of SA has been really focused on this. Now, that's not to say that the New South Wales Premier has done a fantastic job to try to really hard to try to keep borders open. And it's a controversial issue, borders, but the point being is um, if borders are closed, people can't travel and move about. And it has a social um, and economic and, quite frankly, a political impact. And we've seen the political um, and uh, probably economic impacts playing out, um, not so much the social impacts, but... Yeah, look, I think hopefully we'll start to see some some breakage of these um, of these false walls. Um, we may have to wait until after the Queensland state election at the end of October before we see some movement, proper movement there. Um, but yeah, this would be real positive if we do not get borders open, particularly domestically, in the next few months. Uh, it's going to be a really tough stretch for the carriers, um, and you know, probably sadly Qantas included. I mean, Qantas have really really tried to recut the cut the cloth to suit the times. Um, they've dropped out of some major sponsorships today, as, as they've announced. Um, they're doing everything they can, I think, to hang in there. And, look, they will. They've got a great balance sheet. But that balance sheet's obviously been seriously tested. Interesting to see how Virgin Virgin goes with the new ownership, the new private equity owners, and our ex airlines earlier this week. Reminds me a lot of the impulse days of raising some money and wanted to kick off with a domestic carrier next year. So, yeah, it's going to be yes. interesting to see how they go in that market. But, look, you know, the borders stay pretty restricted, well, it's going to be tough, tough times for the carriers. 
tough times for for carriers and translating to the wider industry when we see not just tourism, we've got our hospitality and certainly our entertainment and events industry that really all kind of fall under that same Mm. umbrella. Now, your work with the Australian Tourism Industry Council, for any small business that may not have awareness around ATIC, just explain the purpose of ATIC and, and what you are really working towards on the bigger picture for our industry. Anyone new in their career or business looking at just have an understanding of what the role of Australian Tourism Industry Council is? Oh, well, fantastic. Thanks for the advertisement. So, yeah, look, I'd love, I'd love to talk a little bit about um, the Tourism Industry Councils. And I think one really important takeout, if, if anyone gets anything out of this tonight, is I think whatever industry you're in, but we're obviously talking in the, the tourism and, and visitor and leisure economy, is that you should, you should participate in industry associations. Now, some of them are run better than others. Um, I've run, previously run a national industry body um, before, obviously, my role now at ATIC. Um, and industry bodies actually do a lot of really heavy lifting and really help help industry and can be a great interface with um, with government. So ATIC is the federated umbrella of the state and territory tourism industry council. So in Victoria, we have a Victorian Tourism Industry Council. In Tassie, it's a, a tourism industry council of Tassie and TIC SA and, um, and around we go. And uh, ATIC has three assets, as I like to say. We have um, we run and manage the Australian Tourism Awards, um, which are held annually. Sadly, we won't be having them next year due to COVID. Um, we made a, a very difficult decision to put them on hold for a year while industry tries to reset. Um, but they're very critical, a critical and a benchmark, obviously, for industry. Um, we have a national accreditation program, the Quality Tourism Framework, which you've got on the site there. Now, that's um, everything from entry level in terms of how you construct your tourism business enterprise, how you how you get, in essence, get into business with some resilience backing around it um, through to China readiness and so forth. We've got a very successful COVID clean um, module, which we've introduced in recent months. Um, so we've got ahead of the curve of industry there and uh, fantastic feedback and interest um, into that. Uh, and then the, in the third area, we have a star ratings program, um, which is incorporated into the quality to our quality tourism framework offering and, and, and businesses can be star rated around Australia. And one may think, how does that survive against a TripAdvisor and some of the other models out there? Well, actually quite well. And um, it's it's a localised method of um, providing you know, some genuine ratings around your around your offering. Um, yeah, look, so that's, that's, the, that's the broader national offering, which is then obviously um, delivered at a state and that's delivered at a state level. I have a specific role around policy and advocacy, um, federal government engagement and regulatory engagement. We've upped the ante there in the last uh, 12 to 18 months. And, uh, and uh, you know, I, I wasn't thinking I'd come in and have a, a quiet time. I've come in and uh, a couple of months later we had the bushfire storms, which are horrendous in a number of the states, um, particularly, particularly Victoria, um, New South Wales, Ta- um, South Australia, parts of Queensland, and then, of course, we have this um, little virus. And uh, <laughs> a quick, <laughs> quick funny story about that, I, uh, I, I came back. I was actually over in Europe. Um, with the family, did a big Europe trip and the fires were going ballistic and I was doing media interviews every every night from London, um, basically, and um, tr- trying to get a feel for it and my mates texted me all the time. It was just terrible. Um, but then I got back and literally two days after I got back in Melbourne, um, I, I read on a on just a website about this virus in China and I rang a tourism mate and said, have you heard about this? And he's going... Oh, yeah, I have. But he says, you know, there's always viruses in China. I wouldn't think too much of it. And I, <laughs> I sort of curiosity got the better of me. And I did a few other calls and a few people said, actually, it's quite serious. And um, But we think it's in check. And then within days, it obviously, the, the, the real news got out and the rest is, as I say, is history. So it's been, uh, 2020 has been all about the bloody virus. So. Uh, oh, the virus. And speaking of China, I think the significant dates, particularly for any operator or business or leader that worked closely with the China market, uh, when yeah. that news hit of the virus and then the borders shutting to groups first, then, right. you know, it kind of happened with the China. So I was certainly uh, at the forefront of that. With your background in the China market and that 
political exposure. Where do you see that recovery for the China market? Because I know there, you know, the China market, and even for Chinese Australian Chinese businesses that are really suffering uh, at the moment. Where do you see that type of recovery coming back? Because there's kind of international borders opening up, but for us to experience, like to go back to pre-COVID for for China, that was quite an abundant market for many for for many businesses. What do you? What are your thoughts around there? Well, it's an it's been an incredible market, and yeah, there was very fortunate tourism Australia. We got to develop and drive the strategy around China. Now, um, you know, success is many. As many partners and so it's not for it wasn't ta we're just realizing how big the market could become and it was just having a broader national strategy tourism 2020 and working with the various stakeholders and obviously tiers of government to to help deliver that and uh you know the former tourism minister martin ferguson really needs to be you know, congratulated for that the strategy that he's very determined to, to see happen and ta was the driver behind getting that over the line and uh, i'm a big believer in strategy and a big believer in longer term plans not because um, it's about throwing a ball around the room and, and sounding strategic, but because it does it provides a guiding light for industry and for investors and so forth. But I think the China success was amazing. I mean, at its peak, we got to about twelve, almost twelve and a half billion in uh, international tourism receipts um, per annum. Um, you know, the spend was three times the next largest international market in value, which was the US. Um, obviously, it was more visitors came from China physically in a year than New Zealand. So when you start to add that up, it's been an incredible story. Lots of Chinese, um, the, the Chinese carriers came here, obviously led mainly by China Southern. I was very fortunate to engage a lot with the China Southern Airline through my time in Qantas and then also also in terms of Tourism Australia. So, look, it was right through the, the airport's engagement, the way regions really adapted. A lot of businesses got China ready and became China-focused and became you know, pivoted to China. Um, I hate using that word pivoted, but they basically mm. took the business opportunity and as as we as we know in different parts of the country uh, embrace china and the chinese visitor and they embraced it and um you know we see huge success now you're spot on from that first week in february um many businesses that were china exposed or china predominantly china businesses in terms of their their trade dropped like a stone and there's, oh, there's too many sad stories to go through obviously you know a number of the examples personally and um I, I just feel for them because they worked very hard on a business model targeted a market which was engaged with our country to visit and um, and their high spending leisure tourists um, initially chasing flags as, as groups but obviously that FOT market came through and um, a lot of people don't realise this Australia was the second country in the world that got that in essence um, an FIT, uh, um, an independent traveller visa arrangement. Um, um, so we've always, from all the way back through governments for many, many years, various colours, the engagement with China has always been very strong. Now, I know it's not fantastic at the moment, the optics, um, and I don't really want to commentate on that. I'm, I'm none, no more the web than the next person, but I, I'm actually quite optimistic that the Chinese market will actually come back pretty strongly. Um, it'll take a while to get back to the numbers we're at, but I do think, as you say, there's enough Chinese Australians, there's enough genuine interest uh, for the Chinese in this market, there's a lot of investment that they have, and and they do see that the, the the value of the leisure the leisure dollar being spent down here. So I'm I'm actually probably more glass half full on China than numbers of others, but I I could be proven wrong. Oh look, I share the same sentiment, and we've got Nikos, who's actually it's wonderful to have you uh, on uh, to see your name, Nikos. Nikos is actually from the United Nations World Tourism Organization over in Madrid, who I've uh, who I've met, and uh, I like his questions. Is that something like what? I guess from a now moving forward from a strategic level, is that something that is sitting at the, like, is that a conversation at ATIC level of how do we support industry tackle an over-dependence in the future on a market like China or any other market? Like yeah. what what will be the lessons industry-wide in taking that real force, like it's an emerging market, come, you know, invest in the, in the trade missions, you know, we were involved in doing, pounding the pavement and investing in the travel to you know, to go in in market in China, what would be some takeaways from this? Is that something we would do again in future? Yeah, it's, it's nailed the question. It's a great question. Look, I think you would never have knocked back the China opportunity that we had. It yeah, was, 
Now, a lot of people try to compare it to the Japanese opportunity there in the, um, particularly in the 80s and that fell apart in the early 90s. And uh, the Japanese market got to almost about 800,000 visitors and then it, and it tanked, um, although it's actually sort of got back to around 550, 580,000, I think, before COVID. So there was a long road back. So I think there were some skeptics around China in the early days, but it was just such a, there's been such a connectivity between China and Australia. It goes all the way back to the gold rush days. So if you study your history, um, the Chinese have always been very interested in Australia. Um, some would skeptically say too interested, but uh, again, I'm not going to play into the politics too much. But um, but yeah, so I, it's a, the, in terms of addressing that question directly, um, Tourism Australia have a suite of markets that they look at. Right? The, um, you know, obviously Central Europe, Eastern, um, you know, Western Europe. Sorry, not Eastern, Western Europe. Obviously, there's a variety of markets through Asia, Southeast Asia, and North Asia, and then they have an America's strategy, and um, you know, New Zealand keeps um, ticking over and the you know the political answer is that we've always had a suite of markets. Um, I think the reality is um, our international market very much heavily leaned into into China and it leaned into us. Um, and then in more recent years, the US um, and to some degree uh, Singapore, um, Japan um, really did, did start to come on. And the UK, it's always sort of sat there and gone okay, but it hasn't it hasn't been probably as dynamic as it has in recent years. So. Moving forward, yeah, look, I think we do have a broader suite of markets. I think the probably the, the probably the biggest learning out of COVID, that's for those businesses that actually have a business off the back of all of this, and um, obviously many won't, but many, many hopefully will still do, is diversity of customer is obviously key, but you know, you don't you don't knock back the business to have a diverse, diverse book of customers. I think you've just got to, I think it's just try to hedge, it's just try to hedge your arrangements um, as best you can. I think it's important that Australian tourism businesses work on that domestic market. The domestic market at the end of the day is always hot being, may not be high value per pax, but it's certainly a high value collective market. And particularly in the current environment, it's going to remain a very strong market. And I think internationally, I don't think people should be scared off international. I think in due course, it'll come back. And we should remember that the rest of the world looks at Australia, looks at the Aussies and go, they basically don't have COVID, so um, and New Zealand as well. So we think there's a huge impact of the pandemic that it has because of the health-related response. But check out what's going on in the UK. Check out what's going on in the US. Check out what's going on in in South America and so forth. I mean, they look at us and go, "What are you talking about?" So I, I think we need to embrace the fact that when the borders and borders do start to reopen, I think we will start to see customers tourists coming back part of it will be um carriers preparedness to 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 op suboptimal loads and you know what are there going to be the restrictions from a market point of view as well as an access point of view so i'm as i said i'm pretty optimistic that we're going to start to see some numbers come back in for obvious reasons there's a whole bunch of people with itchy feet who just want to get out and travel and they'll they'll suck up the virus because they have it's probably maybe their last trip or i think well what the heck after what they've been through that is so true that although even here in Victoria where we both where we both live, yeah, it's quite dire compared to other parts of the country. But when you look we're at internationally, the yeah, we're <laughs> living, living the dream. dream. Living the dream. We are living yeah. living the li living the dream. One of my now, homeschoolers here, which is not going to come in the camera, so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's all right. Because even back in my early days of heading into international and inbound marketing new zealand was it like our international market from my background in hot air ballooning that's that was the china back then so yeah. i certainly i'm no nostradamus and i know nothing about nothing but i see as a starting point because then that dropped off when i came back into a tour operation like global where our Western markets were the international market and a really high local and domestic market. I had a five-year break and come back and it was China. Like more than half of our business was a Chinese market. Um, but then where's, where's New Zealand gone? It had completely dropped off and I don't, yeah, I think if I'd looked into it high enough, is it because it's, you know, it's almost become like another state to 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 our economy it was just something it was a product that and a market but i guess in the same way focus 
grows where focus goes. And I guess all of our focus did go into really, uh, really growing and supporting that Chinese market. Yeah. And uh, I, think, I mean, New Zealand's an interesting one. I, I'm, I'll, I'll be frank with you. I think um, as a strategy as a nation uh, and the way we looked at the, the Kiwi market, I think we've done ourselves a bit of a disservice, quite frankly. There's actually great differences between Australia and New Zealand. I know, you know, they're in our constitution and they flog us at rugby and um, we flog them at most other things and there's a huge chip on the Kiwi shoulder when they look at Aussie and these are the And I actually don't think a lot of Australians truly get New Zealand. A lot of a lot of Australians, a lot of my bugalug mates get Queenstown. I don't, I don't blame them. It's a cracking place. Um, but uh, in the South Island, it's a beautiful <laughs> part of the world. But uh, not like that good a skier. But it's, well, I guess, well, I don't want to get too distracted by the beauty of Queenstown. But the, the issue I think is, though, that I don't think Australian tourism, and I could be a bit controversial in saying this, have truly invested in that market in a smart enough way. We have treated it a bit like another state of Australia. Um, we sort of treat it like a domestic offering. It's had a very large VFR component and a bit of an events component and a, a pretty large business component. So you see a lot of a lot of business traffic flicking back and forward. You know, there's some the head office connectivity, particularly with some of the New Zealand companies and uh, they have Auckland head offices and so forth. So, yeah, look, I, I'm, I'm again, I, I think New Zealand actually is a real good opportunity for us. Um, a lot of sceptics say, forget it, it's just a VFR market and I'll never be anything more. But I'm not so sure. I think this new world might change it up a little bit. I think as an Australian, it's presented itself a bit differently to New Zealand. Um, I mean, we don't have a Queenstown in terms of the ski fields, but by geez, we've got plenty of other offerings that um, I think are uh, equally, if not more, compelling. So, um, and so I, I just think we've just got to reframe a market like that. And I think that question earlier was fantastic. We do need to, you know, I think we're reframing ourselves in the US. We definitely were reframing ourselves in the Japan, being a lot more sophisticated with the Japanese market. Um, you know, and I think you look at the, the very sleek, slick, parts of Southeast Asia, Singapore, um, you know, we've seen the movie. <laughs> so, um, it's, yeah. you know, that, it's, you know that's, that was an ad for Singapore, wasn't it? And obviously, they actually invested yes. in as much of the tourism promotion as anything, apart from being an amazing movie, and I think we all got a bit weepy during the wedding scene. I, 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 mean, I get <laughs> trying to show my soft side, but I, I, think the, the point, <laughs> I think the point of all of that is I think we need to think about what those opportunities are, and I'm actually a bit of a, a bit of a believer in um, in Indonesia, particularly Jakarta. So I think that there is so much wealth in Jakarta, and all the wealthy families in Jakarta, a lot of them have their children educated in Australia. And Bali is Jakarta's playground. Well, I think there's no reason why you know West Coast Australia, even the East Coast of Australia, why in in our lifetime that, that, that Indonesia or particularly Jakarta doesn't become a much bigger inbound market for us. But, you know, we've got to address the address the, the complexities of um, the offering and ensure that ensure that we meet that for those families who want to want to believe they're getting a good quintessential experience. In. Something I, I read about, and I'm uh, correct me if I'm wrong, something that really supported business as we now go back to our, you know, planning for the future and re-entering international markets. The EMDG, the Export Marketing Development Grant, that is a huge support to for business. I heard that that's being that that's been scratched. Is that right? Do you, can you talk to that at all? Yeah, that's no, a great question. I can't talk talk to all the specifics. I was on a industry call earlier in the week, and and the, and one of the senior bureaucrats was talking about. Um, some enhancements to the EMDG program. So, no, it's definitely going to be around. There's a change-up happening in the program. I'm sounding like an expert and I'm not um, on this, but um, uh, there'll be there'll be some change-ups and some um, new iteration of the program kicking in, I think, 1st of July 2021. So, uh, no, the EMDG uh, Export Market Development Grants are very um, – uh, coalition governments very engaged in these. Uh, Minister Birmingham – has announced enhancements to the program, so no, I think it's, um, I think they're they're, op- they're good opportunities there. And as I understanding, as I understand, the department is um, uh, Minister Birmingham's department. They're very keen to see tourism, the visitor economy, businesses associated in that really look to use the EMDGs as best as they possibly can. So, I think you know, work with the likes of Austrade. Um, they're a very good organisation. They're big, like all of these organisations, but I think. 
they are passionate about trying to work with businesses that, that see an export orientation. Oh, look, that's what I'd love to see. And it was a thought, I, even before this had come, I thought, well, what would be great down the track is, say, a, an established international business that has exhausted their export market development grant because it goes over a period of you know, five to eight years that that could that you could have an opportunity to start again because you can't mm. go back and use that again but if you're kind of it's almost a restart completely into the market so yeah, yeah if, that conversation really come, if that conversation if that conversation comes up around the table you're you're sitting closer to that i thought where would you even flag that or who you would you go to to say for someone that's invested in international from a gra grassroots local business that entered into international and it was only available through a grant like that to re-enter again now after a COVID situation, that would be really helpful again to go through that and not be discounted because you've already had that assistance. I would love that to be for businesses to be looked at differently. So anyway, yeah, I just I wanted think, to make yeah, that as no, a no, passing comment. That's no, no, a, great, no, a great, great piece of feedback and I think um, – my understanding is that the, the grants are going to be even more focused on on the industry and tourism plays. Um, yeah, look, in terms of reapplying or getting a new grant, I think, oh, look, I'm happy to take that on board and have a look and see if that's a good that's that's good public policy to push forward. Um, you know, I'm a <laughs> advocate in good public policy. And, um, yeah, yeah, I mean, we, we innovated some stuff at Tourism Australia during my time there around, um, you know, new funding models for TA. So, I, I, absolutely, I think we've got to look at, rebirthing as much as possible i mean not every business is, is going to be internationally focused um and we've got to remember that and i think part of the issue with tourism is we're so broad in terms of the different types of businesses and um can get a little bit too caught up sometimes um in some parts of the, the sector more than others i think it's predominantly a domestic a lot of interstate but predominantly a domestic interstate with decent yields, and then obviously international it, it, it's pockets of it, and in fact, in some parts of the country, you know, it's very high, high reliance on the international dollar. And yeah, look, let's let's hope that comes back and allows people to give that, that wonderful opportunity to, to seek out both markets. And that's what's great. And I, I guess I, again, with your policy and advocacy and your government relations role, is also it's it's been lovely to see in this last round of funding to see tour operators also get a look in for you know. A, as a segment, because I know in the funding, particularly when I was in the thick of it, when you see, uh, and we spoke about this briefly, uh, in that accommodation operators could could go, f you know, had support in their refunds that they could receive refund for the loss of bookings. Um, particularly here, I'm speaking specific for Victoria now, but operators and attractions that have really hemorrhaged through this as well didn't have the same opportunity or were looked at you know were excluded in that with that hat on how do you I guess these decisions are made but it's impossible to reverse or get a look in when they're when they're published and you say hey wait a second what about what about us what would you advise for a small business to do to have their voice heard is it just like reach out to their tourism Council, is it a you know go and petition? Does that ever happen? Have you seen that happen in your lifetime when the decisions are made like that, and businesses having their voice heard to mm. say what about us? What about our our mm. little niche industry that have been forgotten in this? That's a deep question to spin. So let me <laughs> have a go. Um, so I think I think if I was a small like operating small business today in a pretty dynamic sector like tourism, there's a, there's a few things I think you need to do. Obviously, you live and break your business, but I think in terms of advocacy for yourself, I think you should um, join an industry organisation um, and check out to make sure that they have their smarts about them in terms of how they engage at a local government, state government, and, if, and if they have some federated model, which could be of value. I think it's actually really important for you as a business person to get to know your your local member of parliament, um, both state and federal, it sounds it sounds very twee. Um, can I say it could be one of the best investments of half an hour you'll have? Um, I, having worked for both state and federal politicians over the years, um, I don't want to do of any banter around politicians, but can I say people that generally come in and talk to a politician and don't want to whinge and complain about something about the you know the electricity companies cut off my cut off my power or um, I've got an immigration problem, whatever, they've actually come with a positive rather than a negative. Um, I, 
they embrace it. And um, it actually, it's important that I think that small business people and tourism people talk to their elected members of parliament. I think one of my biggest concerns through this whole crisis has been a little bit of a lack of understanding about how the visitor economy truly, truly works. I think governments of all colours and state, federal and the like have tried really hard to best support our industry as well as a bunch of others. Um, it's been a terrible time. I mean, the industry, the tourism industry is more than halved in value, economic value in eight months. I mean, it's it's unprecedented, right? It may as well just dropped a bomb. Um, but the problem <laughs> is you've got pol some politicians and some bureaucrats, particularly bureaucrats, who talk like they know how to run a tourism business and they always bang on like they know what the cash flow is, they know what the problems are, you know, they know and and um, the, the, you know, the invoice terms and they, they sort of bang on like they know what they're talking about and I actually don't think they do. And I've, I've been probably I'm sounding a bit forward and I was a bit forward in a number of these meetings saying it's actually not well, how you're describing the industry is actually not what not how it truly operates. So um, so a huge light bulb moment for me has been that small businesses collectively just need to get their smarts together and get really sharp on the advocacy and really explain to their elected members and the bureaucracy, particularly the bureaucracy, how business really operates. I think that's a really big issue. And then that, you know, transcends to a whole bunch of other other, other things. So, yeah, and look, on, on quickly on operate uh, tours and um, it, um, experiences, look, they have really suffered. I mean, even... We tend to, as doing domestic travel, we tend to not do tours and experiences so much, particularly if we're close to home. Obviously, if you're doing interstate travel, it's a bit different and, in, and international visitors are more into these things. So they are really struggling. Um, we're, we're trying some last-minute advocacy to try to get some extra um, awareness and assistance for that. But I think it's going to take a little bit of time, but um, you're not forgotten and we, we appreciate we know it's a, it's a real strain. Oh, look, I see even for the Victoria Felicia Mariani, the Victorian Tourism Industry Council, she has been like, if if if, if I'm going to look back and think of leadership for our industry, for our state, she's been an incredible, um, yeah, just an in incredible, uh, I guess, uh, support and in her communications. And you're right on, it wasn't until the other day someone mentioned the tourism minister. Now, as someone that has had little interest in politics, if anything that COVID has brought out in me is like I've I've got to get, you know, it's brought a, a deep interest in how does the, all of this work and how are decisions made and how are people that I think are at the table making these decisions, finding out in the age what is given to our industry in the same way that I'm finding out and that's just something that I've discovered over this time. It's like, well, that's, um, yeah, what's there? And I had to think, okay, who is our minister again? Not to say I'm just putting this, uh, you know, that's a, again in exactly what you said in terms of having close, uh, being closely connected not only to your tourism industry council but these, um, but yeah, your your local local parliament and also to our to the tourism minister's office. Uh, so that's just something that you know that's important feedback that you've just given for businesses at the moment mm -hmm. that are looking at their way out of this. Now, to finish off just on this with your strategic mind, and you just touched on it, if you were a tourism business right now and you did have, uh, you know, you did have an international market and didn't dabble too much into a domestic market and feeling complete sense of overwhelm. Now, small business, if it's something that I help businesses every day, is helping them bring back to a plan and having a strategic thought process rather than being by the by and that's what we're seeing at the moment too that business is just something that came naturally and evolved naturally you know their revenue stream that wasn't something that that you can't just plan for the next two three months now like we have to look beyond that and there could be I, I like this term a colleague said the other day you know we're kind of there's a sugar rush coming for the industry but we have to look beyond that to something that's more sustainable for us what's some ad strategic advice that you would give to businesses if this was you at the moment in a small tour, you know, as a small to medium enterprise in mm -hmm. tourism, how would you approach a strategic way forward? Sure. Look, I think um, I've run my own consultancy, but it was a micro consultancy, so maybe I'll 
very well well equipped to answer <laughs> this because a lot of tourism businesses uh, only have me, myself, and I, and a couple of others employed. But um, no, I think I think I'd probably give a, a few takeouts here. Firstly, wind yourself back pre-COVID. So at the end of 2019, we had re- record, according to the, the federal data and the state data, um, we've had we had record levels of domestic spending. We had record levels of international inbound spending. We also had record levels of Aussies external spending traveling abroad so what does all that say it says that once things get to a level of normality um people will travel and people will want to engage in leisure activities um i don't think that's going to really change to be honest five years of real basically real wage freezes in this country still saw households if anything grow the percentage of spend that they did in terms of travel tourism um, not not reduce and that's a kind of in um, and it's kind of flips on itself. So I think that's the first thing. I think the other really important things um, is is look at look at your market and look at your customer base and uh, where where it's at and where you think it's going to go to. And I think it's and I think the other important thing is look around at your competitors because I think the one thing in Australian business that's often happened is if someone has does a great thing really well someone down the road will ape it. Then the third person and the fourth person will ape it. So I think you've got to sort of, you know, you've got to, you've got to be nimble enough to keep keep thinking that through. Um, I, I personally think as an Australian tourism business moving forward, you've got to have a domestic a domestic audience. Um, I think that's, you know, it's, it's patently clear. Um, and that's it's, it's the core of our industry and I think it's a core market. Now, I know that means that the offering can be quite different between that and a returning international visitor. Uh, and depends where you you're based and where you where you're exposed and so forth. But I think you need to think long and hard about that. I think you also need to think a little bit about what's the domestic aviation industry going to be doing, um, or the transport sector going to be doing in the next three to five years. Um, they're going to take time to rebuild, um, be it in terms of domestic uh, travel, in terms of interstate air travel. At the moment, it's down almost ninety five percent. Like I mean, COVID's been around for a few months now. Some of the borders are reopened and no one's flying. So I just think that's a that's that's a bit of an omen that's going to take a while to come back. Um, but I think the final the the final the, the, so I think you've got to think about that. I think the final point of view is just believe in your product and believe in, in you and and believe in your customer service. I think customer service doesn't cost a lot to do well. I actually think that's that's the key to a lot of this um, is just having really good a, a, the best product offering you can do had the best service offering around that. And then I guess my final piece of advice, and obviously the trends move dramatically with COVID, is around your digital platform and the online promotion of you, the acceptance of bookings and so forth. Um, I cannot stress enough um, the move to digital, um, if it wasn't already inevitable, it's absolutely happening now. Um, you know, bricks and mortar basically is, is dead. Um, you've got to have a fantastic digital channel. Uh, and importantly, having control over the um, the booking channel or whatever that you have around that, and having a good having a good booking engine and so forth. Um, I know there's costs associated, but if if you're believing that channel is is developing um, numbers for you, you've got to make sure that's working working in sync. I've probably thrown a few things out there, but I think if you've got a good product, you, you've got a good idea, um, you, you think you've got a market that's going to work work with, then you've got to look at just some of those macro macro settings around it but i'm a big believer i think aussies will absolutely travel in big numbers again um and importantly they may do it more in their own country because they can't go they can't um, chuff off to aspen or 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 queenstown or, or get across to bali and so forth in, in the numbers they wanted to so you got to take advantage of that of that opportunity Oh, that is excellent. There's your strategy right there. For anyone that's listening, that is excellent advice. What a great thing to, if if you haven't been looking at it. And also, I mean, a lot of like accreditation, like we see through ATEC and the quality tourism framework, if that's something that you haven't had the opportunity to get yeah. around to that, I hope you, Erin and the team all for you know and the, all the ticks around the country have been slammed with accreditation applications at the moment. I would think yeah. this would have been a great time to also get those things you know get, yeah. get really get their um, get their real tourism excellence on. It's not sexy this stuff, but it's it's mm. really it's really critical. And why it's important is it, it gives you a framework to go back to. That's what we call a quality tourism framework. It gives you a a framework around where your business is at. And it also allows you to punch holes in where you see weaknesses in your business. Now, look, 
I'm probably a fairly basic strategist. So I'm a big believer in SWATs, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, threats. Now, you know, you can do it you can do it against yourself. You can do it against your household. You can do it against your business. You can do it against your, your suburb, if you like. Or, or And I, I think that's they're very healthy things to do um, by yourself as an owner of a business, let alone getting some of your team around and getting a sense check to see if that's working. And I just think you've got to spend that little bit of time um, around where you think the business is is heading and where it's going to go. Um, and I think the other probably the other thing I've been thinking a bit about this is if 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 it's not working, um, if your market's not working, you've got to change it, um, and you've got to be I think be pretty nimble these days and and move pretty quickly and you can have a great business plan you can have a great strategy but if the strategy is not working um, um it, it's it, it might be it might be them not you but you've got to do something something about that and um which is why it's sad that we've had all these businesses that strategically went down the pathway of serving the china market and, get, and did really well out of it but they didn't have a they didn't have a second or a third um gear to pull um and or leave with a pull and so and that fell away. I mean, surely there should have been some alarm bells as well going, how can we get more of a domestic business going? Or how can we get some Koreans? Or, you know, we know there's German backpackers coming into town. We've got to make sure we get a few of them coming along. And perhaps some of these businesses did. But, I mean, the lure of that Chinese dollar um, and the fact they were, you know, very strong tourists. They actually wanted to tour and experience things. I, I can see why so many businesses move that way. And, yeah, let's hope that comes back. Because if we don't have that Chinese market, back to where it sort of was i mean it's it's going to be a, a long rebuild of the international offering that we have um and a lot of businesses obviously going to have to change up or change out sadly i'm being realist but i think that's the sad situation regrettably that we have um with respect to the international market anyway oh absolutely it is it, it is what it is and i think that is uh, absolutely that have your strategy, have your plan. And if anything that this experience has taught all of us is asking that what if, what if this what if this went tomorrow? Because now we can see the reality that these things can happen. Yeah. Because no risk management plan, even was, through the yeah. yeah, has a pandemic on there. Probably the final <laughs> insight. Um, I mean, it was always in the risk register. Um, um, a, a, a major virus outbreak and pandemic was always seen as the, one of the, probably one of the two top greatest risks outside of terrorism um, um, and probably the other one was bird flu um, in terms of impacting Australian tourism. And, I, you know, over, it's funny, you know, those risk registers over the years, I, I, I think it sort of got pushed down the list a little bit. Now, I don't think we could have combated COVID much differently, to be honest. I mean, we shut the border to China as quickly as almost anybody Um there was a lot of pressure on the government at the time to do it and then people read into the politics of it. And, I mean, my gosh, imagine if they didn't shut up when they did. I mean, it would have probably even been a lot worse. So it's it's a difficult one and it's it's just it's just the nature of our industry. It's it's obviously exposed to a demand cycle um, and you've obviously got to do supply to meet that. So fingers crossed. Absolutely. I think, you know, we, 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 it'll, it'll come back in some way and let's, let's hope it's a, it's a strong... A strong industry and importantly for younger people too that they see it as an industry i think one of the things i want to try to give back over the next few years that i'm around in it is just trying to encourage people to get involved in it i think it's a really great industry um and uh, it's 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 pure delivery of often passion and product to deliver an outcome so um and people actually want to come along and experience it so i think it's it's tremendous and and not a lot of industries can can deliver that um and look hey look it's good after dinner conversation too you know everyone's got a view on tourism so everyone's got a view on tourism and i love uh, th this is exactly how we met a few weeks ago even for the young tourism professionals that are following a career path i would hate for anyone to be going and, and regretting a decision of choosing tourism as a career pathway because it is a wonderful industry it will bounce back and as you said it's it's filled with passionate people that are always giving of their time and we'll get you know without we are stronger together we always have been that's our you know our success as an industry uh, globally has been our collaborative spirit to be able to um to share the successes but also get through the challenging times 
Oh, I could keep going and going, but I know it's getting, um, you, you know, there's, um, we have to start wrapping up, but I want to talk, just finish up on you and your, a little bit about how you roll, Simon. What's the best advice that you've ever received? Oh my gosh. In your excellence um, round. This is about you oh, now. Oh my gosh. Okay. Well, <laughs> I, uh, I took a good advice from my my um my cricket coach as a younger as a younger age and uh so because i used to be a reasonable medium pacer um and i bowled I bowl much better muck around leg spin in the nets as, even as a nine and ten year old so i became a leg spinner for the next 15 years so that was good advice um so it kept me in cricket for a lot longer <laughs> and probably i was going to because i did i wasn't going to become a six foot or um bustling in um aggressive fast bowler no i think um well, that's a good question. Oh, look, I think you know what. Well, I, I think the best advice is, to be frank, is is do follow. It sounds a bit cliche, but really do follow your your passions and your passion points and your interests. I think with work, I mean, yeah, you, know, you, you know, yeah, this whole live to work, not work to live type of thing. I think, um, you know, working to live is actually really what it's more likely about. And obviously, we've gone through this situation, and I think in Victorians, we're, we're you know we're all in this together, we've had a different perspective. But I think. Um, I think if you're not doing something that you're really interested in or passionate about, um, it doesn't matter um, what the pay is or what the what the perks are. I think ultimately you'll become quite dissatisfied. Um, I think you know all the research is showing that people will do a number of different careers across their across their um, journey. And I think, um, and in a way, I think that's why I think this is an interesting industry because. A lot of people have probably fallen into tourism, uh, and uh, they might, and a lot of them stuck, and some have moved on. But I think that's why people um, tend to stick in it and get into it, and if they enjoy it. So I think you just got to be enjoy what you do to the best of your ability, because you know, life's pretty short, and you have these changes. So I think that's that's I think that's really good. Personally, I think it's advice I've tried to give to my my kids. Sorry, the door keeps opening, <laughs> my young one. But um, but I think it's you. you do things that you, you you always do better at something that you're passionate about. So find your find your passion points and you know, find what really turns you on, uh, and um, and and go for that. And um, and I think that's that's probably the advice I can with a few grey hairs now I can give give to people. <laughs> and it doesn't always work out, but I think you've just got to you do have to chase your dreams a little bit, particularly when you're younger, because that's that's when you you can do it and um, and be prepared to do do different things and go into different different industries or work for different places but i think yeah i that's that's probably that would be my that would be my advice following the feeling always works doesn't it if something feels good keep pursuing that i think that's great advice now you do a lot of things i mean with your strategic work working at royce com and the work that you're doing at a really high level at atic what are some of your personal habits that contribute to your success what are some things that you do that in your daily habits that you think contribute to managing multiple different roles and responsibilities personally and professionally that you could share with us? Yeah, that's a lovely question. Um, so, look, personally, um, I, I try to stay as fit as I can. I used to be a bit of an animal about wanting to be super fit and um, and was for a long time and, you um, and I had a couple of um, bad injuries, and it sort of slowed myself up. And I've changed changed tack a little bit. But I like to I like to keep my core fitness up, uh, and even just walking. To be honest, I mean, I do probably more walking than anything now. But I I've, I've made sure I've kept my cricket skills up, and my I can kick a footy ball a reasonable way as well. Because my son in particular is passionate about his footy and cricket, so I've got to be able to hold up with him. Um, I think some personal. Um, so that's that. I think it's um, family is very important to me, and uh, just some basic stuff. I know it sounds again very cliche, but I, to be honest, love nothing better than just I'm always the first up, getting the getting the kids sorted, um, getting some breakfast for them, and getting them on their way, um, and just checking in with them and seeing how they are. To me, those are the sort of things that, that rolls me into the day quite well. Um, I sort of I've had to do a lot of travel in my life, and um, I love travel for. Um, I love travel, so I've worked in the industry, but it can get very grinding. And I used, I always used to miss the fact I'd be on a six o'clock flight and not getting the kids um, some way sorted, always rub their head in the morning. Um, and I was a massive believer of always trying to get home at night, even if I took a red eye home. I, I probably more prefer to be sleeping in my own bed than a hotel. So the hotel industry won't want to hear this, but that's always <laughs> sort of how I've, I've sort of tended to roll. Um, I, I read, 
I don't read anywhere as much as I should of novels and stuff, but I do try to read um, some news sites um, um, pretty regularly, at least check in two or three times a day. I've become a bit of an officiato in, in swatting up in LinkedIn. I found that's an amazing platform. You can read lots of insights. Um, there's a lot of self-congratulatory stuff, but there's also a lot of really interesting insights. And I found through COVID, I've found a lot of really interesting people um, as you put stuff out and they shoot stuff back. And um, so I found that to be a really good, um, good platform. The other thing I think is I've tried to um, over the years try to knock around and hang with more positive people as much as possible. I think you can get a bit um, negative people um, weigh you down and I do try to, to work in a more positive framework as much as possible, not to not deal with the, the serious issues that come before you but I think it's always important to, to have positive, healthy um, relationships and, be, and hang out with positive people and and be and be a positive person as much as possible. I think if we're all more positive about the world, um, you know, somehow I may end up turning out to be a slightly better place. Um, so you know, again, um, it's probably a bit of the altruism in me, but that's which is why I came back to that earlier statement around know your local member of parliament. Um, actually, think about it, um, and it's not about the, the politics of it. Just find the good in them and, and get them to work for you because they're your elected member. And I just think too many people are ignorant of the fact there's a democratic political process which just buzzes around them and it's all political. I don't, I don't need to know about it. Well, you do because your taxes are paying for the whole thing and um, you, you have an opportunity to influence and get your message across. So, look, I think that's some of the stuff, and I say that to everybody, you know, if you're bitching your money about politics, well, get to know a politician and, and make a difference. Don't just bitch your money if you want. But... I just keep it on talkback radio. I don't really want to hear hear you moaning if you're not going to make a contribution to try to change it. Oh, I I hear you so good. I just how have I not met Simon before? Since <laughs> the, we met on that panel, how have I not met Simon before? So good. Your book, you know. Now, just do you have a favourite that you would like to share? Is there a book that has made a profound difference in your life that oh, comes top God. of mind? <laughs> But I'm, but I'm flipping out the the cliches. I must. I'm not the biggest reader, to be honest. Um, but I mean, it, it's it's funny because at, at school I didn't read a lot, and um, I had a couple of really quite insightful English teachers who got me to read different things that the others weren't. <laughs> so um, country kid that much prefer to be outside. But um, I, I actually really enjoyed um, Huck Finn and Tom Sawyer. That was well, probably my first really engaged books, and um, I really did enjoy. Um, to kill a mockingbird i know it's again very cliche but it's an amazing book and i've had all my kids read that um look i love political books um to be honest and um yeah look I, I, it's probably I, i'm not really defined by by reading to be honest i mean I, mm. I've, I've read my wife thinks i never read but i actually do read a bit but um but yeah look and i to be honest i actually really like reading about um uh, business people as well um I must admit the uh, you know those books around the rise and fall of Alan Bond, um, amazing book about a amazing criminal businessman <laughs> obviously, but um, but you know the fact that someone like Alan Bond got to where he got to um, was pretty it's pretty amazing. So the books like that I find yeah. really really quite interesting just how these people get to where they get to, and you know there's a, there's a piece in these people that is not very nice, but um, you know, they become successful and they, they define and change things. So, um, you know, the, book, the books about Kerry Excellent. Packer I thought were very fascinating as well. So, yeah, that's, that's me, but I, I, you're more likely to catch me reading The Australian and, um, and maybe The Racing Guide sometimes and um, yeah. reading new books. So. Oh, thank you. the final question, your ultimate holiday. What does the ultimate, like, what, what's the first holiday that you're looking forward to planning um, and i know it will involve your family as a family man or maybe maybe something with you and your wife what what's what are you looking forward to experiencing when we come out of this yeah it's a great question look i um i've been ranting a bit about queensland but uh, <laughs> I must admit, um, uh, we love noosa um so um and the, the, the sunny coast area a lot so it's we've had some good memories there so i think that's that's where we are. We don't I think we're going internationally for a long time, um, but um, but that's okay. I think it's probably that would be that would be great to spend some time not too crowded at um, Inusa would be pretty fab. Um, you know, I'd love to get everyone back down to Tassie, do Tassie really properly. Um, 
spend some time in Freysene. That would that would be that would be fabulous. Um, yeah, look, I'm 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 pretty keen to get my kids have seen a fair bit of Australia. And I've seen a lot of it. Um, I'd like to spend. I'd love to get back to Broome. Um, we did a family gig up there last year for ten days, and it's arguably our best ever family holiday. Um, and wow. um, I just think Broome's a really amazing, well, my way from the East Coast, but I think it's a really amazing, very quintessential holiday, really, uh, and break. And, um, yeah, I think Broome's a really impressive part of the part of our offering. So, yeah, look, they're probably just a few a few sort of places off the off the top of mind that, uh, you know, Portsea Pub would be all right too, but we're not going to let out of <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Well, there's some great holiday inspiration. Simon, thank you so much. We will add people to follow you and your journey. Would LinkedIn be the best platform for you to add into our show notes? To f- yeah, I think so. To connect with LinkedIn, you? You can see me on LinkedIn and um, I, I, it's all right. You don't have to agree with everything I put out there. I try to be very apolitical as much as possible, so um, I've, a bit of a bent on hashtag borders, so um, I'll I'll stay on the consistency because I think we're on the side of right on that one. But um, but yeah, no, I, every now and then I'll throw in. I find that humour doesn't work that well on LinkedIn, so I've I put a couple <laughs> of funny I put a funny one up about a border a border incident in Wodonga involving a man holding a can of VB, and um, no one really liked it. I thought it was very funny, but uh, <laughs> but uh, but anyway, but uh, yeah, but no, I yeah, you can find me there and absolutely and. Um, and keen to follow you as as, as keen to follow those that are keen to follow me as well. I think sharing insights is is really important, and and all the best with the program. It's great to see people talking about um, this great industry of tourism, and um, I think it's important to really get into the granular of it a little bit as well. There's a lot of bulldust spoken about it, but there's also a lot of um, stuff, a lot of truisms in it as well, which keep coming through. And um, we just got to make sure we just keep it front and center about the, what what the issues are, but also what what the opportunities are as well. I think it's important. We've got to talk as positive as we can about the future as much as it's pretty crap at the moment. We've got to keep talking about what that positive future can look like because regulators and governments and, and so forth want to hear about the positives. Of course they do, but, um, you know, and show them how we can get there. So, um, and, um, and thanks for the opportunity to come on your program. So. Oh, thank you. It's been a pleasure. And thank you for, for staying on with us. I have... Uh, to key takeaways to share with everyone that's listening as a summary, certainly from keep it positive, keep surround yourself with positive people from a business strategic point of view, just some insights from Simon that he's shared. Look at your market, look at your competitors, really be driving forward for the next little while, looking at a domestic audience as your core market. Look at what the the domestic aviation industry is doing as a as a collective. Keep your fingers on the pulse on that. And absolutely, I love you said, believe in what you're doing, believe in your product, believe in the service that you offer and the experience that you offer. And certainly something that's dear to my heart is get your digital on look at your platforms, look at your call to actions, look at the usability of the visitor experience before they come and join you. What's the experience like for a visitor when they're coming onto your website? Use this time really well to to polish that. Uh, And uh, certainly a key takeaway, I want to know my local member of parliament and go and say thank you for what you're doing because it must be a really tough job at the moment for our local politicians and beyond that's something um that's something i would look to uh tomorrow actually and if all of this is not working be nimble enough to change it up just we're in a testing environment at the moment aren't we it's all you know experiment and keep doing what's working and change what isn't. What an incredible guest we've had and so much insight and learning. Simon, very grateful. Thank you so much. And thank you to everyone that's joined us on another fantastic episode. And until next time, my friends, I hope you're filled up with uh, op optimism for the future for tourism i sure am and i've got uh, things to add destinations around the country to add to my bucket list to go with my family as well so i love that share at the end my friends if you're listening head over to the tourism pod hub podcast subscribe to have a listen to this if you haven't had a chance to listen to the entire conversation and until next time be excellent today and every 
single day. Until next time, you got this. Bye for now. Thanks again for joining us on the Tourism Hub podcast. If you found this podcast valuable, it will mean the world to give us a review on Apple iTunes. We're also live here every Saturday at 2 p.m. across all the Institute of Excellence Facebook and YouTube channels. And you are all invited. Be excellent. And don't forget, we also have courses available at instituteofexcellence.com to help you and your small business greatness.